I want to welcome everybody um, to this. If you do have um, some questions or comments, please enter them in the chat room, and we will certainly have time for, um, you know, for questions um, and informal discussion uh, after Jan's uh, uh, presentation. So Jan Zuha is the uh, hum Humanities and Outreach Librarian in Archives and Special Collections at Montana State University Library in Bozeman, Montana, where she's been a faculty member since 1995. She holds a master's in English from Clark University, Worcester, Massachusetts, which uh, my wife tells me that was a, Sigmund Freud made a significant, uh, pr um, 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 uh, some lectures there and he, he received his only um, uh, honorary degree from Clark University. So I assume there must be a picture of him, um, probably not a statue, but at least a picture or two. Yep. <laughs> yep. And a master's in library and information science from, uh, from University of Iowa, which we all know is, has a wonderful writers mm -hmm. uh, program. Janice served as president of the Pacific Northwest Library Association. She's been named Humanita Humanities Hero by the uh, Humanities Montana and uh, was recently honored um, with, by the, um, for, as Librarian of the Year by the Montana Library Association. Um, Janice worked closely with the Ivan Doig archives at Montana State University since Ivan's death in 2015. She leads community book discussions and teaches courses that incorporate archival materials into the Doig reading experience. Jan has taken the archive as far afield as possible from creating an archival experience at the Montana State Fair that included sheep shears and a lot of wool to lugging manual typewriters into classrooms so students can experience Ivan's favorite writing tool. Her goal is to enrich public memory and reading by introducing people to the de delights of the archives. The book club and its sponsors, Folio and Friends of the Montana State Library are delighted to welcome Jan as she brings the Ivan Doig archives to Seattle where Ivan studied, lived, and worked. I was glad to have, uh, glad that we were be able to do this because it gave me a reason to reread Ivan's wonderful memoir, This House of Sky. The language in that book is evocative and the stories and uh, characters from Ivan's life are memorable. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. I'm going to mute myself, take temptation away, and uh, turn it over to Jan. Well, thanks, Gary. I'm going to share my screen, hopefully successfully, um, and uh, we'll work off of some slides. I'm I'm the kind of person who really prefers discussion over lecture of any sort. So I would say, you know, at any point, type questions into chat because I will ask Gary if there are any questions. Um, I'd rather have a conversation. So I'm gonna try sharing here. We'll see if we can be successful. And uh, you should be seeing a slide, right? Good, okay, excellent. That's my, that's my first slide, so that's successful. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I wanna, I wanna play you, I wanna see if I can play you a quick clip uh, from our Acoustic Atlas project, which is very appropriate to Ivan. I hope you'll recognize what you're gonna hear here. If I can make it do it, and now I've just clicked out of the slide here. Okay. Can you hear it? You can type sheep into that. I, I'm not going to have that be the background for the entire talk, but it's one of my favorite sounds. <laughs> so, as you know, Janice, a kind of mood music. 
Yeah, it is. It's mood music. It's um, it's how I like to start my talks, and it gets people's attention sometimes. Um, so again, this is well, this is pre-pandemic me here. Um, and thank you, Gary, for that really lovely introduction. I appreciate it. And and I just want to say thanks to uh, the, the uh, Book Club of Washington and the Folio Club and the Friends of MSU Library for having me here. I'm really pleased and honored to be asked to do this. Um, one of my favorite things is to talk about Ivan Doig, his works, the archives. So I'll launch into it here, and um, we can we can focus today on the on Ivan and the archives, um, and especially how his memoir, This House of Sky, is informed by some of the items, the treasures in the archive. If you're familiar with other literary archives like Willa Cather's or Mark Twain's, either physically or online, you know that they often contain evidence of, um, of the writer's process, as well as details of the writer's personal lives and intellectual lives and the times in which they wrote. And we dig through these archives often hoping to find things that are revealing of the struggles they went through, the secrets of their genius, you know, what makes their book so good, or maybe some juicy literary gossip. And um, if you love a writer's published works, it seems as if you're discovering something forbidden, uh, a forbidden treasure when you're allowed to look um, behind the curtain and into the archive. And sometimes these archives tend to disappoint because they have less in them than you might have hoped to find. I think about the tragedy of Jane Austen insisting that her letters be burned, um, which I think was just awful. Um, or maybe a writer didn't really keep great records of their thoughts or versions of their manuscripts, um, not maybe aware that these things would end up in an archive. But in Ivan Doig's archive, the researcher reader is not disappointed. Um, I hope in this session to entice you into exploring his archive uh, as a way into understanding um, a master writer's craft, as, as well as appreciating his specific works. Um, first, I wanna give you a little bit of context where, where the archive is, um, which came to us in 2015 after Ivan's death. We are located on the second floor of the MSU library um, in archives and special collections, and we physically contain I mean, we do not have an accurate count right now, but we have more than 34,000 volumes and uh, over 1,200 linear feet of manuscript materials. I think that's actually a gross underestimate. Uh, we're currently in the process of doing uh, an inventory of everything. We have a new head of special collections. We collect materials in all formats, including digital, as well as selected objects. Um, we curate rare and unique collections that represent the cultural and scientific heritage of Montana and the region, as you can see from the list of topic areas that I, I show on this slide. We try to integrate our collections into the MSU curriculum through teaching. And as the state land, state's land grant institution, we also reach out to the larger community to teach, inform, and enrich the lives of others. And this is where my job, job comes in. Um, I primarily teach and do outreach and get to do all the fun stuff, um, not the processing. Um, we, uh, we are situated in a university with a, so a focus on science and technology and engineering and agriculture. So I like to describe the world of our collections um, as a laboratory of primary documents. And Ivan's collection is a, is a key collection for us. I never assume that when I talk to a group, everyone has equal knowledge of Ivan Doig. Some of you have probably more knowledge than I do if you knew him well. Uh, but I like to give a little nutshell overview of Ivan's life. And um, this, is, this is what this slide is doing. Plus, I like to choose my favorite pictures of Ivan from the archive and, and put them up. Um, I think he's an adorable, homely little toddler here. And I find that very endearing. And I, I always want to um, remember as I read his published works and explore the archive, that the central tragedy of his life is that he lost his mother, Bernita Ringer Doig, to asthma on his sixth birthday when his father was 44 years old. So what you have here is a writer who was raised by old souls, um, by his, uh, especially after his grandmother, Bessie Ringer, assumes the role of mother. Um, and if you've read This House of Sky recently, you know that full story. 
Um, I don't know how many of his books you've you've read, and I love to find that out. So if you're willing to type into chat how many Ivan Doig books you've read, please do. I would I would love for Gary to be able to tell me, you know, do we have any people who say 16 or zero? Um, Gary can let me know. Um, second, once you've admitted that you're somewhere on the zero to 16 Doig odometer, um, which is your favorite one? Type that into chat uh, if you're willing. I personally have read only 15 of his books. Um, I haven't read Prairie Nocturne yet, but I have. that's a summer project because I'll be leading a community discussion of that for White Sulphur Springs online um, in the early fall. My favorite ones usually feature Ivan's, a, a protagonist who is sort of Ivan-like, a young boy who is just learning about the world. Uh, think of The Bartender's Tale or English Creek, Whistling Season. Um, and uh, those I think are, are ones that he is really, he really shines in. Gary, Gary, do you have any input for me from chat? You've muted yourself, Gary. So yes, we have, um, we start with, uh, well, here's a, here's a six uh, from Dawn. Uh, we've got four from Beth with her favorite being this House of Sky. Uh, Dan, who has read everything, um, including all of Ivan Doig's books. And, um, it, and they said, including the book on, on James Swan, uh, which uh, I don't, which I don't see in your uh, up there. Winter your Brothers screen. is there. Yep, here's Winter oh, Brothers. Oh, that's Winter Brothers. Okay, that's what I, okay, I was wondering about that, right. That's a good and uh, um, Don's favorite is House of Sky. Um, uh, somebody's read, uh, has uh, read all of them except one he wrote with Carol, his wife. Uh, Tamara's written, uh, has read several, including this House of Sky. Uh, Linda's read four, Dancing at Rascal at the Rascal Fair is the favorite. Uh, she was read half of them. House of Sky is the best. Um, oh, Dan is uh, has revealed his favorite is the Sea Runners, and he's he got a signed copy of that one. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. um, Susan's read three, including Whistling. Uh, oh, we're going, it's, we've got, if someone's read, uh, uh, Eileen's read nine. Uh, Catherine's read uh, 12, favorite being This House of Sky. It goes, it goes on. So yeah, that's, that's have, great. And, and I've read several, and I think I'd have to say my favorite is This House of Sky among the ones I've read. So I would also say that my parents who grew, who lived in Southern Ohio, Ivan Doig was one of his, one of their favorite uh, writers. So he, he really right. uh, struck a chord with a lot of people. Yeah, it's, that's great to hear when, uh, you know, I'm, I'm used to people in Montana saying that he's their favorite, but when I get to hear about people outside of Montana or the Seattle area, then I'm, then I'm really pleased. Um, the, the one, I, I was really very happy to hear that someone has actually read a uh, news, a consumer's guide, which in fact, is a rarely known first book for Ivan and uh, co-authored with Carol um, in 1972. Um, and I love the depiction of journalistic technology on the cover of this. Um, a more timeless aspect of the book though is the chapter titles within it, which include things like lies, half-truths and evasions, hoaxing and horn blowing. Um, how do you know if it's right? You know, things that we probably could use a second edition on this book for. Uh, uh, and, and I think that um, journalism and this book in particular are interesting foundations for Ivan's memoirs and his fiction as well. As much as any writer I know of, he continuously strove to get things right um, as a good journalist would do. Whether that was historical fact or authentic language, the details of everyday work, the geography of Montana, how you move an outhouse, how you count sheep or whatever, you know. Um, the other thing that this book underlines um, for me is the lifelong partnership between Carol and Ivan. I don't know how many of you also know Carol. Um, 
She's a wonderful person. Uh, they met at Northwestern University's Medill School of Journalism in the early 60s, married in 1965, and both started their careers as journalists, um, but ended up obviously taking different paths. Carol had a long career as a found the faculty at Shoreline Community College as a teacher of journalism, writing, and literature. Um, and Ivan, as we know, went on to do a PhD in history at UW and was a freelance writer for many years until the success of This House of Sky made it clear that he could focus on longer writing and make, uh, make that a viable option. And until that became the major income, Carol Doig was the major breadwinner with her job on the faculty um, until Ivan's books took off. Um, but she continued to teach, obviously. So she was also Ivan's first reader, his first editor for everything um, throughout his writing life. Um, he'll, he'll talk in his diary about Carol's reaction to a draft or a plot line or to the characters. And in, in one instance that I can remember, she insists that he not kill off a character. So he doesn't, you know, he took her seriously and they were a great literary couple. Um, this is one of my favorite photos of them in the archive, uh, 1962, taken in their courtship days when they were both summer counselors at the National High School Journalism Institute in Chicago where they did the successive summers. And it's really, we recently got the records for that period in their life. <clears throat> and it's very fun to see the, um, to see them in the same file before they're actually connected. It's really great. And I love this picture because it epitomizes their relationship to me. Uh, the archive is stuffed with evidence of the rich social and intellectual life that they developed together over their married time in the, in the Seattle area. And I'm, you know, I'm often asked by Montana readers with some sort of sort of an accusatory tone, why didn't Ivan ever return to live full time in Montana? You know, um, and, I, and I think that um, economics obviously played a big role in his remaining in the Seattle area. But um, also they developed this great network of fellow educators and writers and artists and um, intellectuals who became their friends and colleagues. Um, so they were a very social, they were a very social couple. Um, Carol Doig is still very much with us and is actively interested in the ongoing life of, of Ivan's archive. Uh, we get additional items from her on a regular basis. And frequently we, I correspond with her on email to ask her questions for clarification or you know, just to check in. I hope to see her this summer in De Puyer. Um, if any of you have ever heard of the Do Doig Days of Summer, um, the, they celebrate, that community celebrates his birthday every June 27th. So it's open to everyone. So meet me in Depuyer on June 27th this year. I'll be there with some of the archive and fun stories and things like that. And in fact, Carol is probably going to be there. So that's the hope. Um, when, we, when we think about Ivan in Montana, I mean, obviously he wrote in your area as well, um, but, uh, he wrote about the, the Pacific Northwest generally. And though he never moved back to Montana, he did keep coming back to us uh, to do his research, to see family, to take vacations and to promote his books. He was a very, very active author in terms of um, signings and um, giving talks all over. Uh, and you can see in nearly all of his books, the pull of Montana, the country up by um, Browning and Valier and De Puyer, this big circle up here, is the two medicine country of his Montana trilogy and of the bartender's tale. You know, it's a sort of uh, almost exactly that place, but you know, I think of Grovant as a, as a cross between Shoto and De Puyer. Um, but you've also got him writing things in, uh, over, over in the, the right hand, top right hand side of the state, you've got Bucking the Sun, you have Last Bus, Bus to Wisdom set par partially down here in Wisdom, several books in Butte, uh, obviously his birthplace, White Silver Springs. So it's not a complete map, but it's a, but it's a good start to, to situate. And I think it's important as you're reading Doig to think about the places that he's setting things, because that's obviously 
a very important aspect to him and to and to his characters in his books. So um, if we think about the archive itself, um, you know, a lot of times I think there's a sort of magical quality to archives. They just sort of appear and for your use. And, and we don't know, just as when we go to a an art museum, a painting is hanging on the wall, we don't really know the story, how, how it got there. Uh, and sometimes those stories are actually pretty interesting. And in the case of the Doig archive, it's certainly interesting to us because getting this large a collection and making promises to digitize it by September of 2016, uh, changed our lives here at the library. We had to uh, divert a lot of people into this project. Um, and I'm so glad that we were able to do that because it's been a tremendous addition. Um, after his death, uh, we were one of three institutions that Carol Doig invited to submit a proposal. The others were University of Washington and Stanford. Um, and I'm quite shocked that we got it, frankly, but I think our proposal included a really ambitious digitization and outreach plan, as well as we included 26 letters of support from the community, including MSU um, administrators and you know, the usual suspects, but also we gathered a lot of Montana writers who wrote, yes, of course this archive should come here. Um, this included people like Rick Bass, Jamie Ford, uh, Craig Lancaster, Carrie Lasseur, um, Tom McGuain, Doug Peacock, David Quammen, names that may or may not be familiar to you, they're a big deal here, and they are uh, real supporters of archives and of, uh, of this kind of work. Um, and we had entrepreneurs like Sarah Calhoun of Red Ants Pants, um, who is in White Sulphur Springs, um, and several noted historians from MSU. Uh, so, we made, a, we made a good case for this. I have to really credit my dean for going to bat um, to get this collection. Um, at the end of August, Carol announced that we were getting it and it arrived in October. So imagine the loading dock just filled with 180 plus boxes. Actually, my counts here are not exact because you know it's, it's grown for one thing um, uh, and we got together a special team to start working on it, uh, to immediately start digitizing. Half of the collection was digitized in-house, half was outsourced, this is an approximation. Um, I was not the project leader. I was immediately involved in terms of thinking about how we were gonna fulfill those outreach promises, how we were going to get the community to know about this and to use it. Um, by September 16, less than 2016, less than a year after, getting it, we, um, we had it pretty much 90% digitized and offered up on the web with free exploration for anyone with internet access. And we're, as I've said, we're still getting items from Carol. The latest things include her papers from her teaching career. I've been, I've been really encouraging Carol to give us her items as well because um, she's very self-effacing and wants this to definitely be Ivan's archive, but I know that many people increasingly are interested in literary couples, in how the writing comes out of a relationship rather than just, you know, this magical production by a single person, uh, which we know is not the case uh, for most things. Um, we got his, uh, his, Ivan's Air Force records, their garden journal, some of their closest correspondence. And in the future, um, I hope that we will get the full publishing records because I think this the archive is also a record of the publishing industry because he kept just incredible records, as well as Carol's journals. Um, they were a journaling couple. Um, the online archive is up, and I think that I included this link in something that I sent to you, Gary, and hopefully it's out there. But um, it's, as I've said, open and free to everyone. And um, you ha has anybody fished around in the archive yet? If you want to say yes or no in chat, I'd love to know that. And Gary can tell me if we're getting a sum total of zero or half of you or whatever. But if you do go, you're going to find things like multiple manuscripts of all 16 books. And for, for several of the books, I believe we have at least seven versions of the book. 
Um, all of his diaries, the correspondence and photographs, memorabilia, pictures of the memorabilia, like pictures of typewriters and pens and framed pictures, um, uh, massive amounts of note cards and pocket notebooks and research materials. Uh, also recordings and transcripts of oral histories, um, readings and speeches. Um, he, Ivan would often practice any speech that he had and we'll have a recording of him practicing what he was gonna say to a friends of the library group in you know, Tacoma or wherever. We also have his medical records, which is an interesting addition. No, normally you would not have someone's medical records in an archive. Gary, do we have any anybody who has found anything exciting or searched? You're you're muted. Gary, you're muted. <laughs> I'm gonna just keep unmuted and just yeah. be quiet. Um, uh, Beth um, uh, said that she really enjoyed reading the the notes for the books that she had read, and also the pictures that he that he took. I guess uh, he was quite a um, he. Uh, maybe it was just part of his uh, part of his research, his investigation. He took lots of pictures. Uh, Carol took lots of pictures for oh, him. Carol did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we have a few. That's it so far. Work. Okay. Um, I'll just say, and I'm prejudiced, but it's a lot of fun to go into that into the digital gateway. You just don't know what you're going to find. I'm constantly surprised. Um, and I'm going to show this image a couple of times because to me it it kind of it kind of says something about um, you know about what you're gonna what you're gonna get here when you when you go in you're gonna see the building blocks of all of his books and I, I also want to backtrack a little bit and um, Marianne Gwen you're with us here um, on the on the session and I wonder if you'd be willing to say a word or two about when you first saw the archive, because I think you are amongst all of us very special in that you were invited to see the archive in situ at Ivan's home. Is that right? Are you willing to unmute? That's, that, that's correct. Um, and I knew Ivan and Carol uh, pretty well. I was the book editor at the Seattle Times for 18 years. And I think Ivan published probably maybe three or four books while I had that position. And I would always go out and interview him on the occasion of a new book. And so I got to sit with him and Carol and I got to know them and really was so fond of both of them. Um, so after Ivan died, uh, Carol got in touch with me and said, uh, do you want to come see the archive before we ship it off? And of course I said, yes. And I, went to their house and I started going through it. I was really overwhelmed. I, it was just a treasure trove of just these meticulously kept records and, uh, you know, a determination to get down anything that he ever might use in any book. He had that image of the little file box you see. <laughs> had all these Montana sayings in it, some of which were pretty earthy to say the least. <laughs> and, and, you know, and he would, he would credit, you know, whatever of his, you know, pals or acquaintances he'd heard from. And then, you know, all these journals, as you can see, and his typewriter and his, um, he, they even had these, uh, you know, carousels of slides. I mean, they would go on, he and Carol would go on research road trips. I think Carol actually took a lot of the photographs. And uh, so those are always stacked just so. And I was, I was telling Janelle that I am a really disorganized person and my filing method is just to throw things in piles. And so I think, oh, I'll see that. I won't forget that it's there, you know. And I just thought, this guy is, really does have the soul of an archivist but then he turned it into art. It was, it was great. Yeah, I, I really appreciate hearing your perspective on that because I, I um, you know, I see the items here and all of the things that you're talking about have been, have been digitized. So those boxes of index cards and you'll see 
uh, this is a photo that, that Marianne shared with me. Um, this is the set of file cards in their original metal box. When we got them, they were had been put into cardboard boxes and um, we still have all of them, but we've also digitized all of them. So yes, that earthy language can be searched for in the... <laughs> And uh, yes, his favorite thing was to listen in on people's conversations, not not for gossip, but for the ways they right. said things. And um, it was it's it's clear in his writing that this is one of the ways he tried to get things right. Um, and uh, I just think I I've, I've had the pleasure of going into his office, obviously since then, uh, to pick up one load of of the archive after the original load came to us. And uh, it, it's such a beautiful space. I can imagine what it was like when all those boxes were piled there. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing that with us, um, Marianne, thank you. And you know, on this, on this slide, to pause for a minute, you've got things like Bessie Ringer's letters. He saved all of this stuff. You have the photo albums, you have his yellow notepads, legal pads. Um, You've got, this is what was one of my favorite things and I don't show it very large, but this is a writing schedule. So he has penned out, he's created his own calendar and he's got days marked out for what chapter he's gonna work on for this house of sky on which day. Um, if we were all this organized, think of the books we could write. You know, I love Marianne, I love your filing, description of your filing because you can see my office behind me. And I think you and I are probably sisters. Um, I'm not Ivan. Um, you've got uh, the photos. Yes, Carol did take most of the photos that are in the archive. If they're not old, then Carol probably took them. You've got a lot of interviews. This is an interview from Pete McCabe, which you'll see later in my presentation. So this is my way of thinking about his books, is that all of these things underlie the book, and they're in the archive, and you rarely get to see the guts of a book. When you, when you buy a published book, you think, oh, wow, this magically happened. The archive tells you what kind of blood, sweat, and tears went into the making of it. So um, when he when he did a, um, I see the interview with somebody down there. Uh -huh. So did he did he record a lot of those interviews then? Right, those were recorded usually on, and that was done in the seventies. So you've got things that are on reel to reel tape. You have things that are on cassette tapes, and we have trans you know transcribed those onto digital. So there, you can listen to them on the web if you go to them in our archive. And it's great. Um, that's one of my favorite things to do because I think, you know, he writes so well, you can almost hear the voices. But to actually hear some of these voices in, in real is pretty special. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pick out a couple of things from the archive that I really like. This is another one of Mary Ann's pictures here. This is uh, the diary pages in fascicle format. So she's She's got it where the, the tape is still tied around them. Of course, I didn't see them with that archival ribbon around them. Um, when they came here, they had already been undone. Uh, and you've got a picture here that Carol took of Ivan in New Zealand diary. The title of it is Ivan diarying in his in hotel room in Christchurch. Um, and I, I really love to look into the diaries. Uh, as you would expect, Ivan processed his life through words and specifically typed words. You know, he didn't, he didn't handwrite that much and uh, other than just notes. I mean, thank God, because his handwriting is difficult to read. His diaries are filled with his ideas and plans. He talks about how he feels about his writing uh, or about the progress he's making and the details of Carol's and his social and travel lives. Uh, they had a lot of good times. It's really great to read. And there are many, many wry comments about political events or figures or um, things that are happening, um, people, other people that he knows, stories, observations. He's never cruel in his diary or never sort of focused on, you know, sort of, um, I don't know, I don't know the word for it, but but they're very straightforward and and really I wonder, I would love to be able to ask him who he has in mind when, he's, when he was writing these. Um, he's, he's writing in, on April 4th of 1973 in his diary when he's on sabbatical with Carol in the UK. And this is obviously prior to the publication of This House of Sky. 
In fact, it's when he's still thinking of This House of Sky as a potential play, a drama, rather than a memoir. So he's, he's going to the, he's in a bar, had a drink in a hotel bar before summer, supper. And as I stood waiting for drinks, this is in 1973, as I stood waiting for drinks, heard a man behind me tell his two companions, I've been going through a difficult period, pause, from 1946 to the present. And this is just the sort of wry little thing that, that Ivan would hear and that he would remember and write down so that he could maybe use it later or just amuse himself with it. So the diaries are a great thing to look at. Um, there's a lot of evidence of his writing habits in these diaries and throughout the archive. Um, to make a writing life, Ivan wrote doggedly and seemingly all the time. He called himself pathologically diligent. I, I think he learned this at an early age. You had to be pathologically diligent when you were dealing with stupid sheep, for instance, because they were not gonna know what they were doing. He carried pocket notebooks everywhere. So you see over here on the left, these little pocket notebooks. We have uh, several boxes of those and they are not dated. They're not ordered. Um, they are filled with observations and quotes and turns of phrase all jumbled in with the everyday details of the rest of life, such as a grocery list or what he's gonna get at the plumbing store and phone numbers. Um, friends would joke that you had to be careful what you said around him or it would end up in a notebook and then maybe in a book. Ivan often sent, um, set specific writing goals, mapping out how many words he would need to produce in order to finish a book on time or feel he'd had a good day's work. Um, his nearly daily diaries show his devotion to writing generally. In, in December of 1979, he reflects on the enormous task of producing his second book, Winter Brothers, which is, as you know, a combination sort of biography, memoir, and diary. And he says in that diary, I still have the impression this book turned into a kind of blizzard of work that I struggled with it pretty constantly by calendar and yellow pad and binder and files, and ultimately by day by day file cards for the 90 days of text to, to control the material. So I have this impression, you know, he looks like he's so composed and neat in this office with his nice crew cut. This is an early picture of him. And I have this impression of him madly trying to write Winter Brothers with this, just this chaos of materials and somehow he makes it so but he talks about how he's angry with himself for not having to not having written as well as he wanted uh, and so or as much as he wanted so he has to hurry through something another thing that is clearly evident um, is the research uh, that he did that he would do for all of his books um, and the many different places that he turned to for assistance, Seattle Public, as we know, the Montana Historical Society, Montana Oral History Association. Um, he, uh, in one of his books, he pulls, he's in, a, he's in a, a library in Malheur County, Oregon, and he finds a picture in the WPA files of a young boy uh, from a farm in Malheur County. And that boy's picture becomes a character in English Creek one of the major characters in English Creek. And it's, it's a great, and you can see this evidence in the archive. Um, he also, as we've already mentioned, has a lot of interview material in the archives. Um, and uh, I've said this to many groups. My, one of my favorite voices is that of Bessie Ringer, who, um, if you read her character in This House of Sky, what do you expect her voice to sound like? I, you know, uh, I can answer for you, I thought she'd be tough as nails, kind of tough as boots or whatever. Uh, and when you listen to the recording, granted, she's elderly by the time he's recording her, but she sounds like she's just the sweetest little grandma. Like she couldn't, she could bake a great pie, but she probably couldn't hurt a sheep anywhere. But we know from that book that she was out there hurting those sheep. So it's a real treasure to be able to hear her voice. Um, not surprisingly, perhaps, uh, I, you should know that Ivan paid a lot of attention to technique and the evidence is in the archive in spades. Um, 
he read widely and constantly, and he took notes about his writing, and he gleaned technique ideas from all of his writing, reading. And he tracks uh, what he wants to remember in his diaries or in files that he called writer's files. Uh, for instance, in his June 10th, 1982 diary entry, he notes, each book has some great technical challenge. He's writing of his own writing right now. So great technical challenge, which the solving of enriches the work. In Sky, it was to maintain a poetic flavor throughout the book. And many people comment on how poetic this house of sky is. So that was successful. In Winter Brothers, to work with to work with patterns and make the work mimic its source, be a diary of a diary. In Sea Runners, to do a big story scene by scene. In English Creek, and he's currently writing English Creek at, this, at that time. At English, in English Creek, it's going to be forming a completeness, a textured whole of the details to make a forest of the trees. The archive also offers tremendous insight into drafting and revision as part of the writing process. This is a great revolution, a revelation to um, some of the students that I work with, um, who, to whom drafting sometimes seems like a sign of weakness. And when they look at Ivan Doig's drafts, they are completely blown away. Um, even after the manuscript was accepted for publication, Ivan would make revisions, revisions, um, the archives multiple manuscript versions for nearly all of his books make the writer's process very apparent. And the extent of his revisions and his attention to detail, the fact that nothing is perfect the first time it's written, the first way that it's written. But what I, what I really love in these manuscripts is um, the evidence of his often kind of sassy relationship with his editors. So you'll see him talk back to their suggestions and he's not unkind or rude, but he's very confident. Um, so for instance, in this house of sky, some copy editor says, you know, they, they send back the, the, the copy with the accent over the word cafe, right on the final E. Uh, and he writes back in the margins. I don't think that in Montana, you would have an accent over the word cafe. <laughs> and I just find that very endearing. Um, by the time a manuscript reached the copy edit point, he pretty much knew how his character's words should be represented in type. And so he stood his ground on it. And that, that's really the sign of a, per, a craftsman who's really paying a lot of attention to detail. Again, my, my slide. Um, and I wanna, I wanna go this time uh, into just a few items, the archival items that directly impact my appreciation of this house of sky. And one of the big things is, of course, the photo album. Uh, so if you, whatever edition you have, page five, he's remembering the photo album. He's using the photo album as a touch point for memory. He's trying desperately to remember his mother. Well, it was really thrilling to get the physical, the physical albums in in the archive and to be able to have those in your hand to realize they contain the very pages he was looking at as he tried to place himself into his parents' lives before he became part of their family. You've got these little tiny pictures and you can kind of see, these are pictures that um, I think were taken by Bernita's camera. Obviously Bernita's in some of them, so it must've been Charlie Doig taking the picture, but her brownie camera, I think is the one that these come from. He's desperately trying to make out more detail in these little pictures uh, in the tiny figure of his mother. And it's kind of heartbreaking. It's one of the most moving parts of that book, I think. This is um, another of the albums. I think this is one of, this is probably his grandmother Bessie's album um, it, because it had, the pictures are older, larger. Um, and that this, these albums are incredibly fragile, so I'm really glad all of these have been digitized so you can see all these pictures online without having to further compromise the physical object. Uh, we also, in order to make this archive come to life, went out and purchased some, uh, some brownie cameras on eBay so that people who came to exhibits would be able to understand the kind of technology that, um, 
that Bernita, for instance, was using in the 30s. Another one of my favorite parts of the book is the description of all of the bars in White Sulphur Springs. How many of us have been to Western towns where we think, oh my God, they have how many bars in this town? And how many people live here? And his description is the best I have ever read that captures this kind of community of bars. Um, and uh, of course, we have the pictures in the archive, uh, as well as the manuscript pages. Um, you've got here an image of the Lane Bar, which I think is the Melody Lane Bar that he describes, and the Stockman Bar signs in White Sulphur Springs. You have an image of Dory's Cafe and Buckaroo Bar. <laughs> These names are great. Uh, image of the Rainbow Bar and Lounge in White Sulphur Springs, where the hardest drinkers drank, if you remember from, White, from the South of Sky. And when you go to White Sulphur Springs now, I mean, the Stockman Bar is still there. Um, and, and some of these places are there, but, you know, he, he really captured a point in time uh, in going back and doing this research after, after he'd left Montana. The other thing is that we know that drinking was a big part of that culture. His father, uh, I think it's really good to hear that his father didn't get like smash drunk in these bars, that these were sort of business trips in a way. Um, but it gave, uh, I think it was Ivan Will says somewhere in, in the book that this is his like introduction to listening to people and to taking down, taking note of things. Um, so we have many, many, um, many, many cards, index cards, uh, like Gwen was, and like Marianne was talking about, uh, uh, these phrases written down. Um, <clears throat> And they're a combination of his listening. So in, in the file called Lingo Drinking, which is the actual title of a file in the archive, it's about 66 digit, it is exactly 66 digitized five by seven cards uh, with varying amounts of notes on them. One, some cards will have only one line on them. Um, and they're all devoted to the ways that people talk about drinking, think about drinking, uh, how they describe being drunk, the need to drink or alcohol itself. And, this kind of reveals one of his major points of research or methods of research, as we've already said, that he listened in and he would also read things. He'd read dictionaries and he would paste things into um, these onto these cards so he could get to them later. I think of him as a sort of raccoon in this sense. He just picked up anything shiny and kept it for later and he knew where it was so he could get to it again. Um, he would find the what he called the geezer table in a cafe or a bar, and he would listen in um, and uh, then go back to his hotel room or the Winnebago and type out what he had taken notes on. These are here are two geezers, <laughs> two geezers at the <clears throat> the stock. I think that's in there. Yep, yeah, they're in the stockman. And then this is um, a picture of Pete McCabe, who is the old bartender at the stockman that he writes about. And the interview with Pete is also in the archive. And it's very great to hear Pete McCabe's voice. Um, some of the fruits of Ivan's eavesdropping include things like, um, by now he had several bottles of loudmouth in him as a way of talking about somebody drunk. So drunk he couldn't see 10 feet if he went to hell. Uh, looking bad and feeling good. You know, you can really reap some interesting phrases out of the archive. Um, we also have objects. The digital is wonderful, but it's nice to be able to touch one of Ivan's typewriters or very movingly his mother's fountain pen. Um, it's one of the few items that he has of his mother's. Um, and it's an important memento for him clearly. Um, it's, it's so touching because he writes so ardently in this house of sky of wanting to hear the sound of her voice. Um, the pen is one way her voice was heard, given the number of letters that she wrote with it. <clears throat> As Gary mentioned uh, at the, in introdu introducing me, we, we have, we've done a lot of stuff with this archive. We've taken it to the, to the Big Sky Country State Fair, and that was one of my all-time favorite things to ever work on. Uh, we were given 1,600 square feet. Um, you know, a lot of times you think, oh, a, a 
we'll get some pipe and drape and a table, you know, a little like eight foot table and we'll put some stuff on it. No, they said, no, no, you get this whole, you get this whole quarter of this building and you can do what you want with it. So we wanted it to be experiential. And uh, it was, it was a lot of fun to make facsimiles out of the archive. You see on the bottom left here, does anybody know what this is? This round thing that uh, my friend Lavon is carrying here. It's a tin dog. What's a tin dog? Any sheep people know what a tin dog is? <laughs> it's pretty self-explanatory when you think when you hear the name of it. So it's what you he mentions it only once in this house of sky, um, but it's what you might rattle to turn sheep when you don't have enough dogs or you don't have a dog or whatever. Uh, so we had a replica made of that of real tin cans, and that was in the in the exhibit that people could touch. Uh, this is not one of Ivan's typewriters. We purchased some typewriters that we could make work. Um, and we've done a number of things after this. This was in 2017. Um, in 2019, before COVID hit, we had a community program on Ivan Doig and illness. His archive is a really moving record of writing through a terminal diagnosis. Um, in this case, multiple myeloma, he, um, he wrote his last four books under that death sentence. And Carol Doig was very insistent that we do include his medical records in the archive. And you do not find many archives that have medical records in them because of privacy issues. But um, it, was, it was clearly important to her and to him that people understand the effects of, of this kind of thing on, on the production of intellectual materials, on, on the living of life. Um, we have other uh, ongoing projects. I'm constantly trying to discuss Ivan Doig in the community. I've just been hooked up with a book group in um, Butte, Montana, who's, who's going to be discussing uh, 14 of Ivan's 16 books over the next 14 months. So I'll be visiting with them and bringing in items from the archive to their discussions. And I'm also meeting um, with some Montana teachers on a monthly basis to try and get some younger readers to um, appreciate the archive and appreciate Doig's work. So these are middle and high school teachers. We're trying to connect students with archival materials. Um, and I'm always interested to hear if you have any ideas for ways to um, bring the archive to different places, uh, whether it's in Seattle or wherever. So let me know if you have ideas virtually or physically. Um, I'm always gonna give you a, an advertisement for going into the online. So here's the online interface again. Um, so I wanna emphasize that. And um, I'll also emphasize that if you can't find what you want in this archive, you now have my email address, or you will at the end of this, jot it down and email me because honestly, that's like candy to me to have somebody say, well, I need some help finding this in the DOIG archive. Then I have an excuse to spend a lot of time just looking for stuff. Every interface has its glitches. Sometimes things do not work the way you think they should. Uh, it's a huge archive, so we understand when you might need some assistance with that. Um, I also, in our last few minutes, I'm, I'm not leaving any time for questions, Gary. I feel bad about this, but I'm, I'm just going to talk down to the wire. I would all stay on. I want you to know that there are some really great recordings of Ivan's works. If you're not an audiobook fan, um, I wanted you to see that there are some out there and that one uh, it's the abridged version is actually read by Ivan himself. And that's kind of interesting. That's only a three hour book, whereas the unabridged is 11 plus hours. So you get a lot of the memory, the more abstract things are taken out of the abridged version, which makes it a less, in my opinion, a less good version. But it, on the other hand, you get to hear Ivan reading his own, what he thought his father's voice sounded like. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty much a treat. Um, if you run into people who say, oh, I just can't read Ivan Doig, I, his writing, I don't, you know, I, you know, I have run into those people. I always tell them to listen to the audiobooks. All of his books have been recorded. They're available through Audible, through Libro Audio. Some of them are available on things that are free, like Hoopla and Overdrive through your public library. Um, and it's a treat to hear the voices. Um, he only reads that abridged version of This House of Sky, but there are some other really great readers. Who do his um, who do his books? Um, 
And I'll leave you with, or I'll leave this part of this with the idea that um, I want you to think about archives not as dusty or forbidden places. Um, they are for everybody. And Ivan Doig would be the first person to proclaim this. That's why he specifically prepared his own writing files to reside in an archive after he passed. So that's what I have for you. And if we have time and people want to talk, I'll stop sharing and we can face each other and chat. Um, and I'm certainly happy to entertain questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing. So Jan, I have a, um, uh, Ivan did have um, a connection to the Book Club of Washington. And in, in, in 1983, he made a, um, a presentation to the Book Club of Washington and on, on his book, uh, uh, Winter Brothers. And uh, I think it was probably at an annual meeting. In any event, we have a keepsake signed by Ivan that we still have about 10 or 15 copies of and um, they're for sale on our website. However, Jan, I will send you one because <laughs> I suspect you don't have one and you should, you should have one. I would um, love to have one. That's yeah. so kind of you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's very nice. It's a beautifully printed, a letterpress printed uh, keepsake. Um, That's wonderful. So you can uh, see that on our website. Um, and I'll bet you, I wonder if we have that talk, um, a transcript of that talk in the archive. That would be a great challenge to find. Uh, probably not that hard to find. So if, yeah, you ever want think, me to find, if you ever want me to find it, let me know. Well, yeah, I, I'd be surprised, but uh, who knows? I, I, I wasn't there. Um, well, so Gary, what he might have is his, his typed out notes for it. We will have the transcript of, of many of his own, you know, typing script, not transcript, but a script where he will pen in, like my voice should go up here with little notes, you know, and a pause and things like that. And it's really fascinating. So if I can find that, I'll send it to you. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> that would be fantastic. We, we could, we could use, maybe we could turn that into an article for our uh, journal. Mm. Um, we're always looking for, for interesting pieces. I wanted to, to also thank uh, Tamara Belts, who was, it was her idea that we, that we contact you, but she was aware of your work with the Ivan Doig archives and, uh, uh, and she's on our program committee and it's just been terrific. She has recently retired from Western Washington University where she was um, involved or head of uh, special collections uh, there. Um, and so we've been, she's been just a very active member of the book club and are on and is on our board. And Gary, thank you for saying that because Tamara, I had your name on one of my notes to thank and I obviously didn't, <laughs> I yeah. didn't say your name. <laughs> <laughs> and I also wanted to thank Mary Ann Gwynn for, for her contributions today. So uh, when uh, we were, uh, we, Folio has some book discussion groups and Mary Ann's always uh, one of the ones that is, is a, uh, it's, it's an unbook group. So we talk about whatever books we want, but it also gives uh, that we've been reading. And of course, Mary Ann's read just, just a gazillion books and it's always really interesting to hear from her. But I, I'm always plugging things. And so when I mentioned the, the, the Ivan Doig uh, event coming up, uh, well, anyway, you, you heard, I uh, was uh, just so delighted she was able to share some of her early experiences with the, uh, with the archives before they were, they were shipped out. And, we do uh, have a couple of questions. Um, in yeah, let's go ahead. <coughs> Sorry, I've got this. <clears throat> it's not COVID. Um, so um, someone was asking if we can, if they can come in to the archives. Absolutely. Um, contact me. We'll make an appointment. I'll pull out items that you want to see. That again is my pleasure to do that. Um, I am. Um, oh, several of her colleagues have had at the Seattle Times had Carol as a journalist, as Marianne. Journal, Carol is a journalism teacher and said she was a great teacher. That's wonderful. I'm sure she was. She's such a lovely person. Um, let's see. Um, you know, I've looked for an A.B. Guthrie archive, and I know that there is an archive, but it has not been digitized. So um, this, is, this is one of the rarities about what's been done with Ivan's work is that 
such a complete digitization of an of writer's archive is pretty rare. Um, let's see here. Um, Book at Theater did an original version of Prairie Nocturne in 2012, and Ivan did see it, and he loved it. Um, and uh, I think that's in his diary. So you would want to look in the 2012 diaries to see about his, Dan, to see about his um, reactions. There may be more than that in there too, but um, uh, yes, one thing that was essential to Ivan was to get the facts right. He, he fact-checked every aspect of this house of sky, absolutely. Um, and he, you know, cross-checked him, am I right in remembering this? Um, and Dan, you've written a recent book discusses Octavia Butler's writing life. I just am finishing her book, um, Kindred, which I'm really, which is really interesting. But uh, her writing life based on archival research of her materials at the Huntington. Is there anyone using the archives to perhaps publish a book or article on Ivan or his writing life? So this is a question that Marianne asked me as well. To my knowledge, there's no one doing a biography of him yet. Um, certainly that the material is ripe for that. We do have, um, we did have an issue of Montana Magazine. I'm gonna see if I can grab it. Um, if you can see this, when, when we had, in 2017 fall, we had a, a DOIG symposium here on campus and invited scholars to um, use the archives to write about Ivan, and the whole issue of Montana Magazine is articles from that symposium. So um, you can, I'm trying to think of the best way to get your hands on this. I think you have to contact the Montana Historical Society um, or your local library to see if they have access to the full text or get it on your library loan. That's the librarians. <laughs> if, if you could send me just the, the, the picture of that, um, mm -hmm. Maybe we can get a link out to people. Sure, I can, I can, uh, I can do that. And also, Gary, we had talked about me um, sending you an email with some links in it yep. after this that you can then broadcast to people. I'd be happy be to great. do that. And you and I can talk about what those should be because okay. I may not remember what everybody wants. Um, let's see. Um, I'm not sure, Beth, what were you, what, is Beth Boyson still here? Yeah, Beth, you said W book as, as this Mr. Doig's second book. What was that question? You wanna speak up? You no, know, I was wondering if it, I was pretty sure This House of Sky was his first book, mm -hmm. which is quite, quite a first book. Oh God, And yeah. it turns out it was, yeah. Somebody answers yeah. me a little lower. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, um, and that and his uh, his his manuscript was rejected thir twelve times and accepted the thirteenth time. So, oh my gosh! <laughs> for someone in his late thirties to produce a memoir, who and a man who is basically nobody, uh, many people rejected it because of that. You know, at the time um, in the late seventies, memoir was not what it is today. So uh, we're we're very fortunate that someone said yes. Um, yeah, for House of Sky was his first solely authored book. And, and most, this is why I love to bring up the, the news book, because most people don't even know that that exists. It's like, it's just totally forgotten. And I had to, sorry, I had to pay a lot of money to get a copy of it recently. Because <laughs> uh, it's just not, it's not known. And it's not, there aren't that many copies out there of it. Um, what? Oh yeah, Earthlight Wordfire by Elizabeth Simpson is a sort of, it's a yeah, it's a kind of bio. It was uh, she was working, I believe, on a master's or a doctorate, and and this turned into this book, and that's called Earthlight Wordfire. I also have that one somewhere here, and um, it has a lot of. It's less biographical than it is about his work, um, as I remember, but I'd have to look at it again. Yeah, I think he did follow the complete route of the Sea Runners to ensure he had everything correct, <laughs> Carla. Yeah, <clears throat> that, that would be a very Ivan thing to do. Um, and 
I think the Sea Runners is really interesting. He flew the whole route. Okay. Dan, you said that. Okay. I think it's it's interesting. The Sea Runners is interesting because it's his really his only adventure tale. Um, you know, it's very plot driven. It's very it's a very exciting book. But again, meticulously researched in terms of dialogue and this historical detail. But all of the rest of his books, I, th I think, are very dependent upon character and not so much plot driven, though there are, though there is a lot of good plot in, in many of them. You know, I have students who will say, well, he just moves so slow. I don't, I can't, you know, they want this, they want the Sea Runners thing over and over again. And um, I have to tell them, well, now listen to it. Just listen to the book and you'll, you'll, you'll get it. Any other questions that you have? Thank you for that, Cheryl. Yeah, we're very proud of the archive. And um, I'm really, it's, it's, I think it's totally transformed my career here because it's got, I finally get to come bring together literature and librarianship in a way that is not often possible. But I think it does uh, show, uh, you know, like you said, some of the, some writers um, like A.E. Hausman uh, it destroyed everything. And, um, you know, and, uh, but, um, and so it probably is, it takes a lot of time uh, to, to do kind of archiving as you go along, which is what Ivan Doig did. Uh, it's so, it seems like so uh, meticulous uh, about, uh, you know, it, it was, it, it was a literary life and he was an intentional um uh, life that he lived. He um, he loved Faulkner, <clears throat> and you can see in his books in the interweaving of characters that reappear um, and the places that are reused that he's um, that he wants to create a web of fiction and a web of memoir. I think it's it's, it's, a, it's a whole piece of cloth in many ways. Not quite as strongly woven together as Faulkner's work is. But you can see how he would need to keep things really organized in order to understand how to connect things. So he'll have notes on notes. He'll say used in Winter Brothers and then a check mark so that he doesn't reuse something or so that he reminds himself that this, this thing appeared. And Winter Brothers is a bad example because it's not one of those where characters reappear. But there are characters in Bartender's Tale that are in Bucking the Sun because Bartender's Tale is really a sequel in some ways to Bucking the Sun. And yeah, that's that would be my fun. I, I, I should go for a sabbatical project where I try and figure out the web of Doig's fiction. That sounds fun. You're getting a there's a maybe I'm the only one hearing it, some sort of weird feedback, but I can understand everything you said, but it's like some sort of um, uh, feedback. I, I, what I want to say, though, is is that I want to thank you so much, Jan, for for this really interesting presentation. Yeah, hands hands up, uh, and it was just terrific. Uh, it it shows uh, you know the value of 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 our libraries, the university libraries, um, and um, and I, I just love the scholarship that has come out of this of the archives and how much potential there's there still is to 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 uh, to explore um, his writing his writing styles how he came up you know with the uh, with the ideas um, yeah it was it, it, it does come out in this house of sky the the amount of uh, research and careful you know going back and talking to the people and uh, he I think he he decided to become a writer when he sensed he had a um, a talent for dialogue, and um, as he mentions, I think in his foreword that that I I I decided well I you know I love the language uh, the way people talk and it really does come out. Um, uh, you really have a sense of being there uh, with these people. So um, I wanted to mention a couple of things uh, just for the book club. Uh, Why, well, just for anybody? I'm not, I don't mean this is kind of book club um, news. We have a couple of programs coming up um, on June 27, so roughly a month from now. Um, Jane Carlin, uh, 
uh, has um, uh, organized a celebration what? of the Kelmscott what? Press. Um, there's, there's a feedback coming here. Let's see. Hmm. Anyway, um, it's the uh, it's the 125th anniversary of the publication of the works of Geoffrey Chaucer, known known as the uh, as the Kelmscott Chaucer. Um, and it is oftentimes referred to as the most beautiful printed book in existence. So Jane has put together a panel of renowned experts. Um, this. <laughs> um, uh, on William, experts on William Morris and the Kelmscott Press from around the country. The event is being co-sponsored with the William Morris Society in the United States. And um, as I mentioned before, Jane is director of the library at UPS and is an officer of the William Morris Society US. Um, uh, we also then a month later, uh, we have a presentation from uh, librarians at um, University of British Columbia, Simon Fraser University and University of Victoria. They're gonna discuss the thriving book arts community in their respect uh, in uh, British Columbia and uh, show some of the collections in their libraries. So uh, Michael Taylor, uh, he is the current manager of special collections at Western Washington University. Um, he has reached across the borders to um, to uh, enlist these librarians in what should be a very interesting um, uh, presentation. So I want to, um, um, I will send out a follow-up email um, with, with some of the links that, that Jan's going to provide me with, and also a little bit of information about the book club and hope that any of you who are not members uh, would consider joining. We do have members from all around uh, the country. Uh, we publish, a, I think, a very high quality a journal twice a year, and um, we support um, the culture of the book um, in uh, our state and beyond. So with that, uh, I'd like to, um, I guess, uh, um, reluctantly call this meeting um, adjourned unless there's something else somebody wants to say. So. Otherwise, okay, again, thank you so much, Jane, and thank you everybody for coming.